Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Phalaenopsis or moth orchids are the top selling houseplant in the UK. We simply can't get enough of them. However, there is a suggestion in the houseplant universe that the foliage houseplant market may be beginning to plateau, and other flowering houseplants are set to become popular and set a resurgence in the marketplace. Today on Dig It, we thought it best to go to an orchid grower and breeder to get his unique take on the world of houseplants of the flowering kind. A warm welcome, Peter who is no stranger to Buckingham Garden Centre. Where do we find you today? Where you find me today, I'm at home in Middleton Cheney, oh, where well, I live. Excellent. Just literally down the road from, from the garden centre. I am, that's right. I'm about 20 minutes' drive from where you are, actually. <laughs> that's great. So we, we know, Peter, you're, you're a really busy man, uh, obviously with orchids taking up your time. You're, you're incredibly passionate about them. Um, so where and when did this passion for growing orchids you know, come from? Oh, this is going back years, actually, from when I was a young boy. I, I um, My interest became um, quite clear what I wanted to do. My mm. uncle's father um, was a head gardener at Aino Gardens, not far from where I live, actually, in Aino. Um, and he was the, the head grower there. His name was Ted Humphreys, mm-hmm. and uh, he was famous for growing apricots, actually, but they had a big orchid collection there Um, and I used to go over there when I was a young lad to see him and it always reminded me because he had a fantastic Catlia Portia growing in this greenhouse which he was preparing for Chelsea Flower Show and it had 360 flowers on or more Um, and they had to remove the back of this greenhouse to put it in the back of the van to take it to Chelsea. Um, but it, it, this was all in a book that you wrote called Garden Glory. Um, but the village, um, Aino, is well known for being called the Apricot Village. But um, the orchid, that's where my passion came from to start with. Mm. Okay. And did this sort of fascination for orchids sort of steer your career? Yeah, basically... Um, what, how I started growing them after that was it was a little bit longer. Um, when I, I left school in all sorts of things, I, I got myself a job. But somebody gave me a, a Cymbidium orchid um, just as a gift one day. And I only had a small eight by six greenhouse in my garden. And I put it in there. didn't know what to do with this thing, but it did flower, believe it or not. Um, and it was fantastic. And what I'd done is I wanted to learn a little bit more about this type of orchid. So I decided to do a bit of looking around and there was no internet in them days. So I managed to find my local orchid society, which the nearest to me was Solihull um, in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Um, And I made some inquiries and um, I went along to the meeting one day and I I couldn't just join like you can today. You had to be vetted into the the society. Um, wow. And then they would let you know whether you could join or not. <laughs> so I had a letter back from them saying, yes, I, I could become a member. And I this was going back over 40 years. Um, and I'm still a member today, believe it or not, that's good, um, right? with Solly Hall. So that's where my early days started. Um, from there onwards really mm-hmm. and I put myself I wanted to, to become a judge to learn a little bit more about judging all these different types of orchids so um, we have a thing in the UK called the British Orchid Council and my orchid society in Solihull um, put me through um, as a trainee judge through the British Orchid Council, which to qualify took over four years, um, which was amazing, really. Wow. But we had lots of seminars to go to, lots of different um, tables to judge, but it took four years to qualify, and it still does today. Mm. And Peter, can I ask, sort of 40 years ago, when you first started getting interested by the like Cymbidium and things like that, presumably orchids were a lot rarer than they are today. Were, were... Oh, 
definitely, yeah. The only thing that you could find in them days, you couldn't find a phalaenopsis. Um, and if you did, it would cost you um, uh, maybe a week's wages. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, they were very rare. Um, cymbidiums were easy to get. Um, in them days, you could get them quite easily because they were more hardy yeah. um, and they were more available. And don't forget, in them days, we didn't have the overseas nurseries growing them. We only had UK nurseries um, t- that grew them. So we used to have one called Radcliffe Orchids, which was in, um, in towards Newbury. Yep. Um, and that's where I used to go and, and, um, and buy a few cymbidiums from, from time to time. And when I could afford it, so they were very rare in them days to pick up that type of orchid. But I carried on, and um, you know, as I was, and in 2005, as I said, or when I qualified to become a judge, I was over the moon. I had my little judge's badge, um, and then I carried on, um, you know, with the society, helping them do shows and different things. Uh, and then in 2021, a um, bit lot farther forward, um, I was invited to be a member of the RHS Orchid Committee, okay. and I still am today. Mm, that's amazing, yeah. That's like so can I just ask very quickly, what makes a good orchid, if, you, if I want to present you my phalaenopsis, or my moth orchid, what, what are you going to look at and with regards to what makes the perfect orchid in, your, in a judge's eyes? I think if you're looking for, um, you know, like today, if you were judging a phalaenopsis, for instance, somebody put a phalaenopsis up before us, um, the committee, we, we're looking at things that, um, that the structure of the, the leaf itself, it's not too big, it's nice and compact. Um, the flower stem isn't too tall it's got enough amount of flowers on it they're well spaced on the stem a good size Um, and basically that's it and a a good bright colour if you could get a nice bright colour that would be good and the shape you don't want it has to be in proportion the flower wants to be just like a dinner plate basically to look at round Mm. Um, not that size but but, you know to, to that roundness it wants to be I see and from my understanding that sort of commercial orchids these days are all propagated through tissue culture so do the breeders go and look for these uh, prize winning orchids and then take the cultures from them or is it just the ones that we see in the commercial market and in the garden centres and supermarkets are not what you class as a proper orchid or if i could say such a a prize-winning orchid i mean how how does it work um basically with if you want to most orchids are done by tissue culture today they don't do a lot of seed work today um you know they don't cross one orchid with another um that they they pick a nice orchid um the, the big problem is again with breeding orchids if you do it from seed you don't know what color you're going to get Wow. You know, you, yeah, if you okay. put a pink with a white, you could get nearly all whites or you could get nearly all pinks. And they want to know, because of the way the orchid market is gone, people tend to like certain colours. Right. So they tend to produce them by tissue culture and they can get, um, you know, if they want to breed a white, they can tissue culture a white so they, they're all white. If they get a pink, they can do all pink. And that's that's what it is, the same with the spotted ones. So tissue culture is not an easy process to do. You need a laboratory to do it on um, with a thing called laminar flow cabinets and, and things like that, um, which is okay. totally sterile and clean, dry an area. Um, and not, you'll find that the... Sorry? I was just going to say, it's not something you or I could do at, at, at home. We couldn't do it on a small scale with like a little... Petri dish and some agar oh, jelly or something. Yes. I, I don't know what you use. But. No, you don't. Basically, um, when you're doing tissue culture, you're taking a piece of the tissue off the plant itself. Okay. And then that's been dissected in, in, in a laminar flow cabinet. Mm-hmm. And then these pieces then are 
um, put into, like you say, petri dishes and then they're sewn on agar. Um, if you were doing seed, then it's easier to do that. You could do a seed pod um, and you could let, do it from a green pod um, and then you don't have to sterilize the seed too much or you can let the plant, the seed pod develop and do the seed that way. That's easier. You could do that at home, basically, with yeah. a, a, little, a little bit of care. So just thinking about that, do you how do you pollinate an orchid? Just thinking, so I've got three or four orchids that quite often come into flower at a similar time, but obviously they live in the kitchen, so well, there's not many bees that fly around their kitchen to uh, come and pollinate them. Is it something that you can do manually with a paintbrush, or how, how do orchids yeah, propagate? The, the, easy, the easiest way to do it, is um, if you look at the front of the orchid itself, let's take a phalaenopsis, for instance, it's quite simple. Um, if you look at the lip column, just above the lip itself is a thing called an anther cap. It's like yeah. a little white cap. Yeah. And you can get a toothpick mm. and you can pick that off. And there's two pieces of pollen on there. You'll see two pieces of yellow pollen, very sticky. Right. And that will stick to your... That will then stick to your toothpick if you want to use that. Yep. And then what you do, you remove the anther cap and the pollen of the other orchid you want to put it into and then just put the two bits of pollen in there and nine times out of ten you will get a seed pod develop. Wow. Um, mm. Normally within a few weeks you'll notice at the back of the flower, the flower will die off slightly and the stem at the back of the flower will start to swell and that's where your seed oh. pod will develop. Gosh. Mm. That's brilliant. That's okay, so that gives us something <laughs> yeah. to try now, Chris. That sounds Indeed. really exciting. Oh, Let's start yeah. growing some orchids for yeah. seed. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, Peter, you were saying about the, you know, the tissue process. Is that all done in, is that done in the UK or do, does that happen abroad or, or further afield? No, it's all done. Um, the, the biggest one today is a place called Floriculture. They are in, in Holland, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, and they have the, they've got the biggest laboratories basically in the world for doing that type okay. of process. Okay. So, would, um, so and, with that, would... they are really geared up to, to do it. And that's why they do. I mean, if you look at the market today, we're talking maybe, you know, millions of phalaenopsis are produced every year for the pot plant market in Europe, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're in the UK or in Germany or everywhere. And that's why we see lots of phalaenopsis today um, in all garden centres. You know, we see them in supermarkets. We see them everywhere. We do, yeah. And that's why they become incredibly popular, isn't it? I was going to say, do, would this um, floriculture company, would they then supply little plants to go to growers around the world? Or is it, is it, would it be just for the, the, the Dutch market? Or would they come over to the UK? Because I know in the UK we grow yeah. a lot of phalaenopsis now. Yeah, basically today um, we don't. That they come in plug trays. Um, once they've been developed into a tissue, they grow them in plug trays. There's normally about twenty plants in a plug tray, mm -hmm. um, and the Dutch growers then that grow them, they grow these plants on to finish, and they put them then straight into a twelve centimeter pot. Right these little seedlings and in, in these growers, the orchid growers themselves. Um, Florida culture don't tend to grow them. They only do trials themselves on certain varieties, um, which I've been involved in um, for selecting trial plants um, in the past. Um, but that's what happens. These seedlings then go to the, the growers. They grow them on and then they sell them. They normally grow them... Um, very warm, about 85 degrees. Right. Um, and then what happens then is they're grown six to eight months at that temperature, day and night, um, with certain amount of light. And then after that, they get moved to a cooling area, about 10, to 10 or 15 degrees cooler, and that will initiate the flower spike. Gosh, right. So and then hmm. after that, that as soon as they start to flower, they're packed, sleeved, and gone out. Um, you know, they're gone out to, to so, anybody who wants to buy them. 
Yeah, so they, they are quite a long term term crop, aren't they, Peter? They, I mean, to be grown for that amount of time, um, and then the yeah, the, the heat the heat over there is very expensive. And then I I know that going back a couple of years ago, they have to buy their gas contracts for growing um, plants years in advance, um, and they they pay maybe ten years in advance. They they have a contract at a certain figure. Mm-hmm. Um, ga- gas and um, what happened is when the gas prices went up not long ago a lot of growers had to finish because they couldn't afford these new gas prices um, and the cost was so great and then a lot of people that had been in the business for years decided that they could sell their gas contract because they've got two or three years left on it and make a lot of money and so mm. a lot of growers mm. sold their gas contracts and closed down. Yeah, gosh. And that's why Phalaenopsis today is just getting a little bit better now, but it was it was very slow at one time getting some varieties. Mm. And some nurseries have even closed down now. Gosh. So the colours that we see coming through on the Phalaenopsis, like no, recently sort of the yellows, I'm going to say, I've noticed a lot more of, that's purely just to do with the, what the market is demanding and what, the, what you think is potentially going to be the new bestseller, is it? It is. It, um, a lot of the new colours that you see today coming available um, are bought in from Taiwan. Okay. As, seedling, as seedlings. They come in. The, the growers, and actually I'm, I'm going into Taiwan in, in a week's time because I'm judging at the World Orchid Congress over there. Um, And the Phalaenopsis over there are massive. Um, And they grow them very quick because they have the right climate to do that. And then they ship their seedlings over to to Europe or anywhere in the world. Um, And that's where all these new colours are coming from now. And then what happens is that they'll, they'll buy a batch of 100 these growers in Holland will now flower them and then they'll select ones that they think would be good to grow um, so then they would tissue culture those and that's mm. where all the new colours are still coming now out of Holland Okay, and can I just ask, a friend of ours bought us a blue orchid or a blue flowered orchid and I did know, I think it was dyed with a sort of it pigment is. in the water. It, it was. Okay. Because the next time it flowered, it came out a nice <laughs> white <laughs> colour. <laughs> and white. I thought it was a much better thing. <laughs> Do you know who invented that idea or came up with that idea? Uh, that came from maybe somebody in China or that came up with the ideas to start with. What they do is they get the flower stem and yeah. the flowers, um, whether they're just opening or they you know there's so, so many open with so many buds and then they drill a little hole just above a node there's nodes on a fl- on the phalaenopsis yeah, yeah. flowers then just above a node they inject it um it's about two inches from the base of the plant they drill a little eighth of an inch hole halfway through the stem and then they put a little pipit plastic pipit in there full of food dye a special food dye. And then in the morning, when they come back in, believe it or not, all these flowers are blue. Wow, that quick. Gosh. And then when that flower stem dies, the new stem comes and it will be white. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, brilliant. That's exactly, that, that, that's put the end to a mystery uh, I've had for quite a while, but it's brilliant. So they're not, I, I wondered if they were growing the plants in like blue water and it was going through the whole plant, but now you've explained it. That makes perfect sense. It's just a flower that's altered. Yeah, it's just a flower stem that gets it. The thing is, today as well, it, everything's more advanced than what it was maybe 10 years ago when the blues first came. They get you can do it. There's some fantastic colours at the moment that they are doing. Again, this all come from Taiwan, and they're all copying this. Now they've got, they can do a two two toned colour on the stem and everything. Wow! Um, it's not a thing that I, I'm I'm in love with. But no. now the blues, believe it or not, um, 
they've found a way now of manipulating the actual structure of the plant to make it blue without mm-hmm. dyeing it. Oh, wow. That's so um, changing its DNA effectively. Is it it's, a... you're, bas- you're dead right. This is a thing that... Um, it, it, it's it's okay to do that. The public, it, it's a way forward, and the public would like it. They would like all these new blue colours, mm-hmm. um, and then they will flower blue the following year. Mm-hmm. But as for uh, a judging point of view, and registering orchids' names, these have been manipulated. So how can you go down that road in naming an orchid? So it becomes very difficult because we never know where the original plant come from. Yeah, right. Mm. So, um, but it is a, it, it is advanced technology, and I'm sure the public would still like to buy that, and I'm sure people would still like to sell it because it's a blue orchid. Mm. A, a, a natural blue orchid, a natural colour. Yes, mm. yes. <laughs> well, natural. Well, natural. <laughs> uh, yeah, natural. Colour. Unnatural. Yeah. Unnatural. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Brilliant. And I guess things like that sort of do alter the price because it always interests me that in supermarkets and some places you'll see orchids sort of being thrown out at next to no sort of cost at all, say yeah, ten, twelve pounds. What What's the difference between a good orchid and that you're going to pay maybe 20 25 pounds from a garden center and the cheap one okay let basically um orchids are graded when they, they normally grade a grade b grade and c grade mm-hmm. um and they always have been um some flat some orchids are better than others some phalaenopsis and what you do is that supermarket orchids are normally bought from dutch orchid auctions they have an auction every day in, in Ellesmere. Yep. Um, and supermarkets tend to have a, a broker that goes into these auctions and they look at the best price that they can get. And I could tell you, like on a Monday morning in Ellesmere auction, there might be 10,000 10, um, white phalaenopsis come through single stem. Yeah. And certain times of the year, in the summer especially, when nobody wants to buy an orchid so much, is that these plants become very cheap. Um, You can buy them for less than a geranium Mm -hmm. in the auction, but then they just come over here, put them in in supermarkets, um, and you you see them in there. But they're still in the sleeves. They don't take them out the sleeves. They're cheap. You never, when people buy these orchids in supermarkets as well, is that they're, they are a reasonable price. Sometimes you, you think, well, how can they sell them at that price? But most of them are bought as gifts. Mm-hmm. They're then given to their friend who's been ill or something like that. And if that plant dies or the flowers fall off it within a week, they're not going to phone their friend up and say, look, I've just lost your orchid, you give me. (laughs) And so they know they can get away with lots of things. They have no after-sales service. They don't have any experienced sales staff or no experienced growers that can help you out. Again, that all goes down to price. All they want to do is to clear everything that they've got for their fresh lot Mm -hmm. that comes through the auction. Now, when you buy them, garden centres work totally different. Um, And I'm sure, you know, your garden centre is exactly the same. You buy from your regular supplier. Mm. He's not a broker. He sources what you want. You may get a list from him and he will tell you exactly what's available on the day um, or on the week that they want to deliver. He will then... Maybe he won't buy these from the auctions. He will go and select all the grade one plants from the growers. And then they come in to garden centres. But you will pay a premium for that. The good thing about this is, as well, is that you're getting a better plant when they're in a garden centre. 
They're normally taken out the sleeve. Most garden centres take them out the sleeve so that the customer can see the, the plant itself, not mm-hmm. just the, the, the flower, but they can see the plant. They've got an after-sales service if something goes wrong. They have experienced people that look after house plants, so they know how to look after it. They offer the full package. They offer the compost. They offer the the fertilizer that you need for them in everything. So they've got that full package, and that's why they can demand a bit better price. Ah. Yeah. Now you just briefly touched on you no know, fertilizer there. Am I right? You shouldn't use like baby bio or your regular houseplant foods for orchids. Well, no. The, the problem is today with all or with any feed that you buy today, um, they contain. I won't go into too technical terms with the um, NPK, but what you you need to look at is that when you buy feed, you want to buy a fertilizer that contains no urea ah. now if you look on the bottle if you look on the bottle of a bottle of orchid feed it will contain no urea if baby bio they would use a thing called um urea nitrogen yep. that's very cheap and that's all it is it's just a cheap form of nitrogen and right. because orchids grow in bark mixture The urea nitrogen doesn't soak into the compost very well, and it will burn the leaves. It will burn the foliage, sorry. Um, What's that again? It will burn the roots Ah, um, quicker. That's why orchid feeds that contain no urea are very good. And that's what that's what we we always recommend that you you use. And going on from that, Peter, um, what sort of advice would you give to somebody who's, you know, new to growing orchids? You know, maybe starting with maybe the the moth orchid, the phalaenopsis, and maybe to your your favourite, the, the cymbidium. Any any tips um, for getting the best from those plants? Um, phalaenopsis are, are easy, really, to grow. Um, what you've got to realise with phalaenopsis, you can buy it, it can stay in flower for six months. Mm. So look how much value you've got already. Right. So what happens is that you you take um, your cymbidium, a uh, uh, phalaenopsis home, um, and then you'd put it in a, a, a nice warm room. But don't water it when you get it home. Just leave it alone. Let it settle down in the conditions it needs to be in. So if you've got a nice these facing window, that's always the best for most plants today because they get early morning sun. Don't put it in a south facing window in, in the summer, um, especially between July to the end of August because you'll burn the foliage and the plant will just disappear. Um, so a, again, you can put it on a, a, a south facing room, but not in the window itself. I would then once it's been in there for a, a few days, look at the pot. Now the orchids grow in clear pots today, which is maybe a good thing in one way because the public then can see what the root system looks like through that pot. And if this, if it looks dry, then give it some water. If it looks wet and it's all green inside the pot, then just leave it alone. It could stay another week without water. It won't hurt it. And that's all you need to do. And then every three weeks, just give it a drop of feed. So we basically say that you water one week and feed the next. Water, feed, water, feed, all the way through the year. Only if the plant needs it, though. And you can see that by looking through the clear pot to do that. And with regards to the colour of the roots, do they they change colour, don't they, when they're sort of satiated or, or not uh, or needing water? Yeah, if you pick an orchid up when you when you buy it in a garden centre or anywhere, really, um, a garden centre is always good because they're not in sleeves and you can see the whole thing you're buying. If the roots look a silver colour um, through the pot, then this plant then is dry. But even when you get it home, don't water it straight away. Let it settle down first. Okay. But then if, it, if it's green, 
that the roots look a green colour and, and a little damp. You could see that through the pot, then just leave it. There's enough moisture in there to do that. Excellent. More more orchids are, have lost through overwatering than underwater. Mm-hmm. Isn't that always the way with house plants? Definitely. Yeah, and with re- with yeah. regards to watering, is it okay just to? I mean, uh, I'll I'll say I, the way I I water mine. I just mm-hmm. you know, put uh, I've got a nice pot that I fill up with water uh, with rainwater, and I dump them in that for ten minutes, and then pull them out, stick them on the saucer, and let them drain down, and then. That's it for the next week that, or two. Is that the best way, yeah. or should you do... Oh, okay. Do, I'm doing something that's right, good. Chris. That's this good. Is, that's this good. is a rare thing with plants, <laughs> isn't it? That's brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Thank it, you. Yeah, I mean, basically, to water, I find that um, I like to water from the top. I've always been a believer it only rains one way, and that's from the top. Okay. Um, and in nature, phalaenopsis are growing on trees. They're epiphytes. Mm-hmm. Um but they grow upside down in nature. They don't grow upright. They grow, the flowers always grow downwards and not upwards in nature when they hang from a tree. So the water just runs straight off it. Okay. Now, if you're growing, if you start watering from the bottom, the roots are going to get too wet sometimes at the bottom, but it's not going to soak to the top of the pot where it needs it as well. So it's easier to water from the top and let it drain mm-hmm. through. Yeah. That and, that, and then that's, that's as much as you need. And the whole of the compost is getting a certain amount of moisture. P- Peter, I, was, I know uh, people, there are people that do leave them in water for 10 minutes or a quarter of an hour, and that's fine. You know, they get away with it, but some people don't. They just find that it's, it's too much for it and the plant can't take it. Mm-hmm. Peter, I was I was looking on, on, on the, online actually a couple of days ago, and there's a lady who, basically, she's a, a an orchid saviour. She goes around and, and basically finds all these um, orchids in garden centres, DIY stores, which have been discounted, looking very sorry for themselves, and she, you know, she resurrects them. But what she did say, which I think was really interesting, she she gets them home, she gives them a little bit of TLC, cuts the flower spike off because obviously the flowers are finished. And then she doesn't put a cane back in, so the flowers can naturally droop. And on her, her um, I think it was on her TikTok or Instagram, she had these these pictures of these uh, orchids, which she's got she got in in clear pots on her wall, and they were just sort of dangling down, and they looked really natural and really different to the way we see them, you know, in our homes on a on a on a on a stake and a, on a on a cane. So, is that the way to go? Are we should we let them be a bit more free? Give them a bit more freedom. Well, not really. I think that the, the lady who does that, it, she she obviously likes the way they grow. Mm. Um, it doesn't make no difference. I mean, most people today like to put a stake in um, and let the flowers stand upright. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they've only got that amount of room to do that, maybe in a window or something like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there are people that do orchids that they grow them and let them grow a little bit more natural. They can do that. Um, but I, I think the easiest thing for most people is if you if you're experienced, then it's different. But if you're just at, at the beginning stages of growing orchids, um, then you know just buy, buy it, leave it in the stake, and then when the new stem comes, just stake it back. You know, I mean, once you've got a little bit more experience in doing things, you can experiment different ways. Mm. Interesting. And is there any way to get the flowers bigger? Because I know when I've been travelling around and you go to, sometimes I get to go to a fancy hotel and in their foyers you see these massive phalaenopsis flowers in flower. But my mine never seems to get <laughs> to half the size with the flowers. Is it just the actual plant that I've got and I need a different, a better cultivar or a better sort of version of that orchid or is it the way I'm caring for them? Uh, it's nothing to sometimes it's nothing to do with care if you if you can flower orchids regular um you know from when you buy them and they produce a flower stem every year or or um you know uh, resurrect your old stem to make it flower again um but some people go and you can buy an expensive phalaenopsis in london for instance for instance um, and they buy from a company called Optiflora. 
Um, they are the best phalaenopsis growers in, in Holland. Right. They are. They, they produce massive whites, and they're called Eucadian. Ah, mm. yeah, because they've all been white, these big phalaenopsis I've seen, so that makes yes, sense. Yes, they, they are. That, mm. They're like dinner plates. Yeah, they're um, lovely. And... That, they are, and they are special. They're not like your normal ones that you see in garden centres, but they may pay about £65 for an orchid like that. Well, mm. OK. Be- yeah. But they're expensive. Yeah. So um, you pay your money, you get you. what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, do, you do, but they, they, they still need the same amount of care as the, the normal ones. They're exactly the same. They oh. can still die. But in their hotels, you know, they've got that type of money that they want to decorate their, mm. their hotel differently and, and things mm. like that. Yeah. Um, and some of the upmarket florist shops in London will will definitely tend to do that. I'll have a look out for one of those then and yeah, treat myself to a nice um, uh, big flower phalaenopsis. That would yeah. be good. Well, even, even, even your supplier, you know, in, in garden centres can ask for, um, your your supplier will get orchids for Optiflora yeah. if you need them, if you need mm. orchids. And they do all different colours, you know, they're not just white. Yeah. Um, but they do have what we call high quality orchids. They have four stems on sometimes. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. it. And they, that's sort of, yeah, they always look far better than mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but P- Peter, often things can go wrong with with growing orchids, can't they? Um, from your experience, what's the what's the biggest pitfalls people tend to make? I think the big problem is today is that um, more plants are lost by overwatering than underwatering mm-hmm. um, and people just don't tend you know that they, they'll buy an orchid um, and they'll take it home and they'll water it straight away and they get bud drop the buds will start to fall off it yeah. and what you've got to realize as well is that if you're buying an orchid in the winter you could you're buying it in, in from a nice warm garden center or, or a, a supermarket where it's nice and warm. And they're all grown in, um, and kept in super bags as you walk in the door where the heat comes straight down on them. And that sometimes is, is a, a kiss of death for, for most things. Um, but when they take them home, they're putting them in the car and it could be cold in the winter. So that only just across the car park, that cold chill could cause a problem. Um, and that's why I say is to get it in the car quick, get the thing at home, keep it in your conditions and let it just stand there to, to acclimatise for a few days before you even do anything with it. I'm sure you will get bud drop um, from these things to start with. And, and that is the thing. And it's always good sometimes to buy an orchid that's three quarters open um, before you, when you buy it, then at least you're guaranteed that the rest of it could open quite easily. But people want to buy them in bud, and then the buds fall off. Mm-hmm. So it's far better to to buy a plant. I always feel with at least three quarters of the flowers open. Mm. That's fair enough. Yes. And with regards to the sort of speed of the flowers opening this year for the first time ever i did something different with my orchids which was um not you know the base the, the first um flower on the base of the stem opens first and then they sort of slowly open up yep. um quite often i end up with one or two buds right on the tip of the stem that don't open and your uh, so manos uh, told me that when, if you cut the stem at the second or uh, second node it'll grow another stem and you'll get a whole nother flush of flowers. But this year I just left it and the little buds that hadn't opened, after all the other flowers had dropped off, about a month or two later, they opened and they flowered. Is that just the natural sort of way things go and the orchid was happy and it was just doing its thing? Or are my orchids flowering too slowly or what? The, no, I think I think the, the 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 thing is with with any phalaenopsis today is that it's best to let all the flowers open. And Manus was what, right in what he says in one way, is that I believe that you let all the flowers open, and then when they start to die off one by one, that that is the time to cut the stem. But you, what you need to realise is that you need 
to leave at least one flower open on the end of the stem when you cut it. If you let them all die, all the late. sap that's in the flower stem will go into the pot and you oh. more than likely that stem will not reflower. But if you cut the stem when the sap is still in the pot, and you know that's in because you've got one flower left on the end that's alive. So then you could cut it. I always say three nodes. Manus wants to do it too. Um, if you cut it three, you'll finish up with a flower stem the same as what you've roughly had before. Ah. Um, just cut it half an inch above the node. You do nothing with it. And I would say there's a, a 60% chance of the whole thing producing another flower spike from the old stem. I might be wrong. It may have been the third node he said, but <laughs> I thought it was the second. But Something. yeah, okay, that's brilliant. So, because the other thing that he mentioned, he said if you do that, obviously it makes the plant work an awful lot harder, and potentially mm. the following year you won't get a flower out of it because it's used all its energy. But does feeding sort of every other water reduce that, or what's the best way to I get? Think so. What you've got to realise is the compost that you use today, we use bark compost, um, good quality bark, um, and, and uh, you'll get that from garden centres because they always tend to stock a good quality bark. Um, and then when you repot it, there's no nutrients in orchid bark at all. There's no nutrients in it. You know, you've got to put the nutrients in the pot. And I'm a big believer that you need to feed regular when the plant's in flower and out of flower. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you'll see sometimes um, orchid fertilizers have a bloom and a grow. Yep. Yep. They, wow. So we always say that if you use the bloom feed, that will encourage the flowers to get um, a little bit bigger than normal. Um, and also that the, the, the colour will stay that colour for longer. Um, and that's why they use this different ratio in the bloom feed. Um, and then when the flowers have started to go out of flower, like when you cut the flower stem off at the node, you change your feed over then to a grow feed because that will encourage the plant to regenerate a new flower spike. Right, right. So, mm. good tips. Thanks for those. I'll uh, see what we can do next year with my orchids. Then uh, yeah. they are great in, uh, yeah. in the sense that they are so easy to grow, and well, yeah. I can grow them. So, yeah, cymbidiums <laughs> are slightly different for feeding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most people who buy cymbidiums, they, they only flower through the winter anyway, um, because that's their season. Um, you can buy them normally from September for the smaller ones and the bigger flowered ones are normally around about this time. Um, and I always say that after Chelsea Flower Show, cymbidiums are finished for the year. Um, so anybody who's got a cymbidium who's grown indoors through the winter, the most important thing now is that in the summertime, in May, when the, or even when the frost are finished, you can put it outside in your garden in a in a shady area, yeah. um, and but when it's outside, this is where you need to do your work because you need to produce a new pseudo bulb for that pseudo bulb to produce another flower spike for the following season, and to do that, it's feeding that makes the difference, and orchid feeds that you see don't tend to do this. This is just a one-off only for cymbidiums. I recommend that anybody that's got a cymbidium, they put it outside from, from May onwards, and then mm. while it's outside, they still need to water it, and they still need to feed it. But use a thing called Kempac number two. Okay. Yep. It's, a high it's a high nitrogen feed. Yeah. And you could get that. It's, it's normally a powdered feed. We use it all the time. And then what you do is you feed it every second time you water through the summer. When the 
temperatures start to drop down in September, towards the end of September, you bring the plant in then, and then this pseudo bulb needs to be hardened off. And then you just change the tomato feed. And tomato feed will harden the pseudo bulb off and produce a flower spike. Perfect. And that's, that's the best way to make a symbidium flower. That's good. Yeah, but Peter, we 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 mentioned right at the beginning of the the, the the show that we were going to talk about other sort of flowering house plants. Um, obviously, they hopefully a lot of them will be gaining in popularity. I know when I started in the nineteen eighties at Rochford's, you know, it was things like African violets and begonias and you know pot mums, incredibly calanchoes. What, what sort of flowering plants would you like to see sort of come back into the fore? Um, I mean, you know, you know, with 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 orchids firmly in mind, but uh, any other other forms which would uh, make 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 you smile? Yeah, to be quite truthful with you, I, I'm I'm a big lover, lover of all different types of plants. Really, I mean, um, you can sometimes um, house plants as well. You want something different that's flower. Calancho, we call them, um, is a succulent, mm-hmm. basically. Um, and that they produce some fantastic flowers today, all different colours, many more than what they ever used to be. Um, and you can also buy a succulent called uh, Echevera, um, part of the, the succulent family or part of the, the cacti group. But you can buy the, the foliage on them are very fleshy, a mm-hmm. um, bit like an aloe vera, really, um, but they're small, and they have some fantastic colours. You yeah. can get, you can get reds, orange foliage, everything, and it really looks fantastic. And they do flower; mm. they do produce a flower as well. But again, um, streptocarpus. You know, um, mm. we have one of the biggest streptocarpus nurseries in Europe, and now in the UK. Um, yeah. and that they have some fantastic colours. Their their breeding regime are on top of their game all the time. Yeah. Um, if I can mention the name, but D- mm. they, they absolutely they yeah. are. I'm sure I'm sure you've heard of them. And mm. and to me, I think they are one of the the, the best nurseries for producing. Stri- well, that's all they do is streptocarpus these days. Um, but the colours that they come out with are unbelievable. Mm. They get gold medal after gold medal after gold medal at these big shows. Um, but they are on top of their game. And the flowers are very good. They're easy to propagate. Um, you know, the plants are when they get bigger. You could take cuttings from them. Um, again, African violets. African violets have gone a little bit out of fashion because they're not available like they used to be. Indeed, that's one of the things we've found at the garden centre. People ask for them; it's a you know, it's a favourite one. But yeah, getting hold of them has been really, really tricky over the last few years. Yeah, I think the problem is I think there's only one very small nursery left now on the continent that produce them. Um, and sometimes you see um, one or two of them, you know, in the auctions or re- even in the markets over there by the tray, uh, and that's it. But you don't get them like they used to be. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now that's a plant but, from you know, memory that definitely doesn't like being overwatered, isn't it? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. They like to be on the dry side. It's the same with succulents, really. Succulents are okay. They can be. I mean, I've got a few succulents in my my kitchen window, um, just growing away there, and they grow quite well. But again, don't get any water on the foliage, mm. um, and try and try and use rainwater. Rainwater is always better. Collect it in a in a bucket. Let it stand there in a jug the night before, so it's at room temperature. Same with growing with orchids. It's exactly the same, you know. Um, try and use rainwater. It's always a little bit better. Because someone once told me, always sort of warm the water up on the radiator, so it's almost tepid. Is that a good idea or not? The water from a radiator? Yeah. Or no, no, no. no. <laughs> so uh, I've got my water bucket outside and I uh, go and get a jug of water and then I from the bucket and then I stick it on the radiator to warm it up. Not so it gets massively warm, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably 25 degrees or so when I generally use it. Is that a good idea or not? Well, I suppose it would work. I, I, 
I've never tried it myself. I just put it in. If I, the plants I have here, I just bring a, a, a little jug full in um, and let it stand at room temperature overnight, and it's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I think if you used it from a cold water but straight away outside, then it would be a problem. Mm, yeah, because that's what I was told. Is that you, you shock the roots if you put them into really cold water, um, which yeah, is why I was right. told sort of you know, always warm the water up a little bit. But uh, yeah. yeah, like you say, sort of room temperature or, mm. or is probably best. Yeah. That's what the plants yeah. in, isn't it? And as I say, going back to uh, African violets and paulias, when I used to grow them commercially back in the eighties, we used to grow them on sand. They're actually on big sand beds, mm. so they got the humidity um, uh, from that and. Uh, it was a re- it was obviously a, not the best material to grow house plants in quantity on because sand gets a bit dirty and you know you get uh, but it's obviously capillarity is great and you get that humidity and they grow really well yeah i think really i mean it's like most house plants today you use a good compost you can but i always tend to buy a, a basic um house plant compost from a garden centre but then I'll put a bit of a mechilite and a bit of grit with it mm-hmm. um, and that helps with a little bit of drainage and I just tend to do that extra yeah. um, and it's the same with, with cacti you know it's actually the same I use I always put a little bit of a mechilite and a bit of grit in extra yeah. um, to give it a little bit more drainage mm. Okay, Peter, we're coming towards the the end of the the podcast, but we usually ask our our guests um, a couple of questions towards the end, and uh, it's our our shipwrecked on a desert island one, so which tool or plant would you wish for, or you could enjoy life on your virtual island? Uh, Any thoughts? Go on a a desert island. I think the only thing I'd ever need, I I could take two phalaenopsis with me, um, plant them on a tree in a desert island and let them grow naturally, and then we could um, hybridise them from seed on there. Then couldn't we? It'd be be yeah. all right. And all it all, I think all is I'd need then is it, I've always got a, a, a good um, what I call a good in a knife in my pocket with mm. a, lots of different gadgets on it, and I always feel that um, I. I've always got that in the greenhouse with me as well. So mm. um, yeah, you could manage off of that, but again. Again, you know, phalaenopsis uh, is a big passion of mine. I've been involved in phalaenopsis for years now. Um, I've grown them. I've got awards from the RHS for some of my hybrids that I've done over the years. Um, And I've even had them now tissue cultured and they're available. Um, They used to be um, years ago. I don't know if they still are now or not commercially, but... um, and that's it. Wow. You Fantastic. Know. Yeah, that's a good accolade, isn't it? Yeah. And I guess yeah. sort of through your life in horticulture and giving all the wonderful talks and doing all the judging that you do, you've possibly come across some amusing tales and stories. Could you share one with us? I've seen people come in to, to bring orchids into me um, asking me to repot it or what can I do to revive it and um, I think the worst one I had was when a lady had repotted this orchid into a bucket it was a phalaenopsis and she came in with a bucket and a handle on it and she repotted it in garden soil okay and it, it, it was and when I mean, obviously there was no roots left on it, and, but the leaves were still in <laughs> pristine condition. Um, and she said, well, "Why doesn't it flower?" And we took it out this bucket, and there was no roots on it whatsoever. But the leaves were really nice and healthy, and I, I just couldn't believe how the plant had survived that long. Um, <laughs> we we put it into bark, um, and I just told her just to leave it, and uh, what we'd done. Because it got no roots to anchor itself to, we put two pieces of cane on either side of the plant yeah. just to support it a little bit. Um, and uh, it, it it did grow a little bit, but it took a long time. But it took so much out of the plant that I think eventually it just died anyway. Oh, um, bless. But it, <laughs> Memorable. That was, that was the, the worst thing I've ever seen, I think. <laughs> Brilliant. So a tip to our audience, 
Don't grow your orchids in a bucket in garden soil. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> that's, that's right. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for all of your helpful comments and, and the, the discussion we've had today, Peter. It's been brilliant. That's fascinating. It? No, thank it's you. good. It's, it's, yeah, it's good to invite me. And uh, I'm pleased that um, I just hope that what we've discussed, it will help a few people. I'm sure um, it will. And like I said, like I said before, you know, it, it, you get after sales services from from garden centres. You can't get an after sales services in a supermarket. So, just if you want to know a little bit more, you have to buy from garden centres. They have knowledge in there. Look at Chris. Mm. I mean, I I talk to Chris quite a lot on some garden plants that I have here. He, he's just he's just a He's just a walking encyclopedia. Chris is. I, I, yeah. He's unbelievable. <laughs> totally <laughs> agree with that. Bless you, Peter. Totally agree with that. He's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. brilliant. We, we, but the thing in gardening, as we know, we, we're learning all the time. And, and today, Peter, you've certainly enthused us to grow even more orchids. So thank you very much. And, thank uh, you. And, uh, okay. Uh, and Peter, just finally, um, uh, to find out a little bit about what you do, is there any uh, websites we can, we can guide our um, podcast uh, listeners to? I, I feel that if people, I don't have a website at all. I run, I do run a, um, I have a mail order company, but not on orchid plants. I have a mail order company called Orchid Accessories. Nice. We supply orchid accessories through mail order. Right. Um, I have people phone me up from time to time, want to know a little bit about orchids, uh, but you can get my phone number off the website. Um, okay. Okay. And or people or an email address. People email me all the time, uh, and okay. I don't have a problem. But if they're if they're very keen on on growing orchids, the best thing for them to do is to join their local orchid society. Um, and to get that, they go on to a thing called the British Orchid Council. Mm-hmm. You can find it on the internet, um, and then it will give them a list of all the societies in the UK. Mm, okay. Up and down, and also a list of all the shows, orchid shows up and down the country. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, we'll make sure that information goes on to our um, Dig It show notes, uh, Peter, so that'll guide people to those those uh, those websites. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Really good to talk to you. Okay. You take care. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk